Hello, I'm Sinead O'Gorman and I direct Scholars at Risks Europe at Maynooth University, Ireland. Welcome to Free to Think 2020, Scholars at Risks virtual conference, marking the release of our annual Free to Think report. The conference includes five geographically organized panels discussing academic freedom issues in China and Hong Kong, India, Yemen, Turkey and Europe. It also includes a special session marking the close of Scholars at Risk's 20th anniversary year, including the release of the report and presentation of Scholars at Risk's Courage to Think Award. I thank everyone in the audience for joining us for this session and invite you to visit the conference page for the schedule and links to other sessions. I also invite audience members to use the comment function in Vimeo to share your questions, but please do try to be brief to make it easier for the panelists to respond. If you have privacy or security concerns, you can choose to post your comment anonymously. Audience members may also use the like function in Vimeo to support a question, raising it to the top of the queue. And the session in academic freedom, the session is academic freedom tensions in Europe. I'll be your moderator and it's my pleasure now to introduce our two speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Sejal Parmer, lecturer at the School of Law at the University of Sheffield and a visiting professor at the Central European University. Dr. Parmer works in the field of international human rights law with a particular focus on freedom of expression. She was previously an assistant professor at the Department of Legal Studies at the Central European University, senior advisor to the OSCE representative on freedom of the media, and senior legal officer at Article 19. Dr. Parmer is currently a co-rapporteur of the Council of Europe Committee of Experts on Combating Hate Speech. Welcome, Sejal. Our second speaker is Martina Dermanen, Vice President of the European Students' Union and a member of the European Coordinating Committee for Academic Freedom Advocacy, which is convened by Scholars of Risk Europe. Martina has been an active member of local, national and international student movements for six years during her studies at the University of Malta. Martina gained a background in students' rights as human rights and solidarity coordinator of the European Students' <clears throat> Union. Her work at the European Students' Union includes policy development, advocacy campaigns, and project coordination concerning the social dimension, public responsibility, and sustainability of higher education. Welcome to you both, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm really looking forward to your important insights on this pressing topic. So let me open our discussion by remarking that we are seeing unprecedented levels of activity in Europe right now on the topic of academic freedom. The findings from our 2020 Free to Think report show that attention to this issue in Europe is certainly warranted. The report finds that over the past year, political actors in different parts of Europe took leg legislative and administrative actions that undermined academic freedom and, and the institutional autonomy of particular higher education institutions and, in some cases, of entire national higher education sectors. Serious attacks have been reported last year in Turkey, Hungary, Poland, Romania and Russia. And over the past several months at Scholars at Risk Europe, we have been expanding our own advocacy work together with partners across Europe. Our immediate goal in this work is to insert data on academic freedom into official records and reports in Europe with the broader goal of informing the EU's internal and external policies as they relate to academic freedom. So I hope that our discussion today will provide an opportunity for participants to learn more about uh, the academic freedom tensions in Europe today, as well as some of the important efforts that are currently underway to address these. 
So I'd like to ask our panelists to begin um, by providing an overview of what they see as the current pressing challenges to academic freedom in Europe. I'll then follow up with a round of questions to the panelists, after which we'll have an opportunity to uh, take questions from you, the audience. Um, so Dr. Parmar, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, Sinead. And my thanks also to scholars at risk for this invitation to speak at um, the uh, 20th anniversary conference and the launch of the 2020 Free to Think report. So given the increasing scale and range of um, attacks on academic freedom globally over the last, last um, few years, the work of scholars at risk has become ever more important. Uh, the detailed annual reports have become uh, really vital sources for human rights activists in the field, but also, as I know myself, scholars and academic communities themselves concerned about the shrinking space to teach, research and engage within um, and across their jurisdictions. So my aim in these initial comments is to spotlight some of the current and recent issues concerning academic freedom in Europe. And I shall actually speak both as a human rights advocate and scholar with a particular interest in uh, freedom of expression and someone who was primarily based um, for many years at Central European University. Um, as a member of that community, I experienced and saw firsthand the consequences of the legislative attack on the university by the Hungarian government, but also, more positively, the amazing civil society campaign um, uh, in support of its cause, which um, included um, uh, scholars at risk, and also the beginning of its transition to Vienna in the last academic year. And it is upon the uh, prevalence of legislative attacks that I would like to focus my comments. It's a theme that is strongly emphasized in the Free to Think 2020 report. Um, applying a comparative lens, though, it can be seen that whereas scholars and students in other regions experienced violent attacks, arbitrary, or arbitrary arrests, detentions and deportations, in Europe, the attacks on academic freedom and institutional autonomy have tended to be more subtle under the guise of the rule of law, but in practice are uh, just as targeted. So before I offer some uh, concrete examples, I'd like to offer um, some general reflections on the hallmarks of the challenges of academic freedom and institutional autonomy in Europe over recent years. Uh, first, these attacks seem to be underpinned by similar motivations, social conservatism, illiberalism, authoritarianism, a hostility to open societies, an impulse to silence opponents, chill political expression, clamp down on spaces for expression and peaceful assembly, and set an example of um, certain institutions and individuals to send out a broader political message. Second, these attacks on the space to think, question, and share ideas appear part of um, a broader assault on free expression, including media freedom. So the most serious attacks on academic freedom and institutional autonomy are taking place in states whose ranking in uh, press freedom terms has declined um, in recent years also. Third, um, these examples um, show states deploying the law as the key strategy for repression. Um, regulations and um, legislation are pushed through with little or meaningful or, or, or um, no meaningful public scrutiny and oversight. Um, fourth, in terms of their effects, these attacks are um, trends. Um, so individual cases of legislative or legal attacks have provided subsequent inspiration and precedent for other states in the region and also beyond. Fifth and more hopefully, despite being pushed through by populist uh, governments, many of these attacks have been met by popular resistance, uh, with protests on the street, pushback from the academic community and civil society and legal challenges. Um, but six, the challenges surrounding academic freedom and institutional autonomy have tested the robustness of U Europe's democratic institutions, precisely because they have been under the cover of the rule of law. So in the last five years since the uh, Free to Think report has been published, the most high profile attacks in the region have come from within the family of EU member states. Um, but those institutions, those democratic institutions at the EU level have been condemned and criticized for their inaction or acting too late. 
So the result of this has been not only the chipping away of fundamental human rights and democratic values enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights and the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, but also um, the erosion of public trust in those democratic institutions that are supposed to uphold these values, including academic freedom. So how have states deployed the law to undermine institutional autonomy and academic freedom? Uh, within the EU, there are three countries of major concern, and the most notorious case is that of Hungary. So almost a year ago to the day, CEU was officially inaugurated at its new campus um, in Vienna. The institution was forced to relocate um, its US accredited programs from Budapest to Vienna after legislation was adopted in relation to its foreign accredited um, uh, programs. Um, the um, Court of Justice of the EU recently in um, October this year ruled that the requirements of the so-called LEC CEU um, to enable foreign universities to conduct activities in Hungary were contrary to EU law, um, WTO law, um, and um, in terms of EU law, um, uh, contrary to Article 13 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which protects academic freedom and um, institutional autonomy. Um, but as the Free to Think report shows, there has been a gradual transfer of the ownership of public universities to state control and the politicization of university appointments. So last year, 15 research institutes um, of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences were removed and placed um, in a new um, established um, state research network. Uh, and this year, legislation has been adopted, transferring ownership of the public University of Theatre and Film Arts to a foundation with a board of government supporters, undermining its autonomy and independence and also threatening um, quality education. In Poland, there is a, um, a legislative proposal um, branded as a freedom package, which purports to defend freedom of science and free speech on campus, but which, in fact, um, will do the exact opposite by subjecting teaching, learning and research to scrutiny by a committee dominated by individuals appointed by the government. And while the recent verdict um, just a few days ago of the Warsaw Court of Appeal dismissing the slap lawsuit brought by the government against Professor Wojciech Zdrowski is to be welcome, there are still two lawsuits from the government controlled TV station um, against him, brought um, against him for his tweets critical of the um, ruling Law and Justice Party. But Poland is not the only EU country gaining sucker for its approach. Um, uh, from um, the Hungarian example. Um, this summer, echoing the Hungarian decision to deny certification for courses and programs in gender studies, Romania adopted an amendment to the education law effectively doing the same, banning, banning gender studies. Um, um, and at the moment that is subject to an appeal submitted by the, the, uh, the president to the constitutional court. Um, but nonetheless, the motivations and the intentions are the same. One state which um, should draw more attention in the future is, is France. Late last month, um, in response to the killing of history teacher Samuel Paty, the French Senate introduced new um, legislation stating that academic freedom is exercised having regard to the values of the Republic. So though um, freedom of expression and academic in independence is protected by the French constitution and also under the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, this development shows that legislative attempts to undermine academic freedom don't just emanate from Central and Eastern European countries in Europe, but can be um, also um, present in um, Western European states, driven in this case by a new wave of anti-Muslim sentiment. So turning now beyond the EU, in Russia, the foreign agents law has been um, shown to discourage scholars from engaging in research supported by foreign funding. And um, last month, um, prosecuted ordered a university in Moscow to submit as part of its inspection, detailed information about students who participated in mass protests. So beyond these legislative attacks, another theme that comes through strongly is a crackdown on students and scholars who are protesting. Um, in Russia, um, there are uh, numerous examples which the um, Free to Think report um, uh, details, um, including of um, students um, uh, being beaten for criticism of President 
Putin, the detention of um, a Moscow maths professor holding a peaceful demonstration in support of uh, a student and government critic who has been in pre-trial detention, um, and the denial of entry of a French sociologist um, scheduled to participate in a conference on protest movements. In Belarus, of course, there have been numerous arrests and detentions of students and academics um, during protests contesting the re-election of uh, Pre President Lukashenko in August. Within Europe, Turkey, of course, remains a, a grave concern. It's an outlier uh, in legal terms because its constitutional protection of scientific research um, uh, does not include the freedom to engage in activities against the existence, independence, integrity, and in indivisibility of the state, um, but also because of the sheer scale of violations of academic freedom over the years, especially since the failed coup attempt in 2016, um, after which there has been the investigation of and dismissal of thousands of scholars, um, abolition of um, universities, um, the direct appointment of administrators by the government, um, and other um, uh, challenges, including the blacklisting of uh, academics. Um, and this summer, another university, Istanbul Sahir University, was closed clearly for political reasons. Uh, finally, turning now to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, which I thought I should mention. Um, on the one hand, um, the pandemic has um, shown uh, the importance of the um, development and sharing of all sorts of ideas and information regardless of frontiers. Um, but it has also resulted in the significant pressure on and within institutions and the academic community, um, the job security of academics um, and also their, their well-being. Here in the UK, the Institute for Fiscal Studies has calculated that there are about 13 universities at risk of going bankrupt during the pandemic because of their already um, weak finances. And there is a fear that the appointment of a um, new economic hit squad uh, board by the government is evidence of um, very opportunistic policy making um, so the government can decide which universities um, shall survive through this pandemic. So those are my um, initial comments. I, I very much welcome um, questions and comments on my um, uh, presentation and other issues. So um, I just hand over the floor back to Sinead. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sejal, for this excellent overview of the current pressures um, on academic freedom in Europe, with a particular focus on leg legislative challenges over the past year. Um, I think your assertion that these current threats present a litmus test for the effectiveness of Europe's democratic institutions really goes to the heart of the matter. I hope we can come back to that um, as we ask how Europe is responding. Um, so first, let's turn to Martina for an overview uh, from the student's perspective of threats to student expression across Europe over the past year. Thanks, Martina. Thank you, everyone. And, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and then in the week that we celebrate International Students Day. International Students Day commemorates the lives of more than 1,200 students who were arrested within Czech universities back in 1939 and executed in concentration camps as retaliation to their demonstrations against the Nazi occupation of back then Czechoslovakia. We've of course come a very long way since, since then. And 72 years, it has, it has been 72 years since uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the United Nations. And today we have also just closed off the eighth working program of the Bologna process. The Bologna process is Europe's unique international collaboration and framework between 48 countries um, on common key values within, within higher education, such as freedom of expression, autonomy of institutions, independent student unions, academic freedom, and free movement of students and staff. In fact, one of the successful outcomes um, of this working plan of the Bologna process that, that I would like to share with you today, because it was something that ESU has also strongly lobbied for um, within this plan, is the work that was done within the Task Force on Fundamental Values in reaching a consensus 
within the European higher education area, the EHEA, on what we define as academic freedom. And furthermore, there is also an agreement now in the communique that uh, has been adopted by our ministers um, that they are asking the Bologna follow-up group now within the next working plan to pursue the development of a monitoring framework for fundamental values. That includes student participation and also academic freedom in higher education. This is an important step in, in, in the right direction that ESU will continue to be following up on. But of course, we are still at the very start of a long uphill battle for the promotion and defense of academic freedom to become a reality in all of the countries in, in, in the EHEA. And I, I particularly refer to here Russia, Turkey and, and Belarus as members of the, of the European higher education area, where we are witnessing grave violations and atrocities to academic freedom and the rights of students, to the freedom of expression, opinion, thoughts, information and assembly on a frequent basis. The Free to Think report, uh, while it is a major tool for civil society organizations and human rights organizations, including ESO, uh, for our European advocacy work to promote academic freedom, it's also a very grim wake up call to the harsh reality that youth and, and student activists are facing for trying to, to improve their society at a time when society needs it the, the most. We see in Turkey the four-year crackdown and massive purge on, on scholars and students that has been ongoing since the failed military coup in 2016 that has severely paralyzed Turkey's academic community. Up until this year, students are being imprisoned and, and prosecuted for peacefully demonstrating against, for example, Turkish uh, military actions in northern Syria. While thousands of, of dismissed academics are still awaiting justice, facing lengthy delays and appealing their dismissals and are una unable to work in academia. This reality is something that I fear will be mirrored in, in Belarus. And I would like to take this chance to draw on the hardships that one of ESU's own member unions, the Belarusian Students Association, BSA, has and continues to face. For about 20 years, to, to, to give you a bit of a background on BSA, despite them not being allowed official registration as an NGO, they continued to protect students' rights, to protect, to promote the Belarusian language and, and culture and act for the improvement uh, of quality and innovation of higher education. But however, over the past 11 weeks, of the study year since the uh, rigged presidential elections and nationwide demonstrations uh, against Lukashenko's illegitimate regime, BSA and uh, the Student Initiative Group have collected evidence of 359 detained and 138 expelled students. Why now, this week, even BSA's own members are being held and interrogated in KGB prisons. While many other students are being forced to leave the country due to the threat of violence and, and criminal prosecution, the European Students' Union is doing its uttermost and its best to continue amplifying the call on the international community, including the European Parliament, the Commission and the European Higher Education Area, to show solidarity and support towards Belarusian students. While many responded to this call, including the Scholars at Risk Network, Amnesty International, the Open Society Foundation, Frontline Defenders, among others, and we thank them uh, for their immediate response and their support, ESU expects much more from the European Union and European higher education area in standing firm to fundamental values of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. In when we refer to foreign and, and education policy decision making. International cooperation and, and solidarity is currently under threat when our nation's leaders do not take a firm stance against injustices happening outside of their borders. In Russia, the government continues to restrict and frustrate academics and students' freedom of movement through targeted actions including entry and exit denials and deportations 
against specific individuals traveling to or from Russia. Pending and enacted legislation has threatened the freedom of scholars to engage with international counterparts and the ability of universities to independently manage disciplinary proceedings. In light of all that I've said, ESO is stepping up its efforts and advocating for more legal frameworks and policy strategies for, for protecting and promoting academic freedom, especially within the, cont within the next working plan of the Bologna process. We see scholars at risk set up of the European Coordinating Committee for Academic Freedom to be a, an extremely crucial platform for the academic community to share good practices, for, um, for organizations such as ESU to enhance its capacity on academic freedom and to build more, resi more resilient and effective strategies for the protection of academic freedom in the hope that students and student movements can freely associate, associate, mobilize, and express their opinions for the establishment of democratic societies that work for the many and not for the powerful few. So I thank you very much for, for inviting me to give this presentation here and to be part of this discussion. And I welcome any, any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Martina, not only for this um, excellent spotlighting or overview of the current pressures on students across Europe, but also to the European Students' Union more generally for the very impressive work you've been doing, uh, standing in solidarity in particular right now with students uh, facing such severe pressures in Belarus. Um, I, and also for that uh, hot, relatively positive news, I think hot off the press from you uh, with regard to the European higher education area meetings today, there's the ministerial conference, uh, which was uh, due to be held in Rome and has been uh, rescheduled to today. So thank you also for the update in that respect. Um, we have some questions coming in and I'd like to invite the um, participants to keep keep sending in your questions. I have one before we get to the participants' questions. I would like to ask you one follow-up question of my own. Um, so in the past two months alone, we've seen a number of important statements, resolutions, and reports from different European bodies and institutions on the topic of academic freedom. Uh, Martina, you've already mentioned the uh, communique from the European Higher Education Area and the work of the Bologna follow-up group, but we've also seen uh, communications by the European Research area in the form of the Bonn Declaration on Freedom of Scientific Research, and we've seen a landmark decision by the European Court of Justice. Um, can I ask you both to, or each of you, to say a few words about those um, recent uh, reports and statements, and could you maybe speak to uh, your view on how effective they are, maybe beginning with you, Sejal? Sure. Um, so. If I could just situate this um, attention on academic freedom by institutions within Europe, with, within a broader global context in terms of um, in terms of standard setting and, and in terms of interpretation. So um, um, in uh, September this year, the um, UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression um, presented um, a report um, written by her predecessor, David Kay, on the subject of academic freedom. So certainly academic freedom at the global level is getting um, more, more attention, which I think is, um, you know, extremely significant. There's still um, that, um, there's still more that needs to be done at the international level. Um, uh, for example, through um, uh, a general comment on of the um, Committee on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, but but there is certainly a, a greater level of attention um, within the UN human rights system on on the subject. Um, at the European level, um, yes, there there seems to be um, um, a sort of a, um, more activity in 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 this uh, space, um, and this includes um, just tomorrow um, there is a. a, a uh, parliamentary um, assembly of the Council of Europe standing committee um, meeting on um, a new report on threats to academic freedom, um, which um, looks very interesting. I haven't had an opportunity to look at the report in any great detail. However, it does um, indicate the possibility, um, or at, less, uh, at least um, as, uh, in, uh, flag up um, an assessment of the feasibility of the drafting of a binding instrument um, that could 
um, set up a proper international uh, framework um, of assistance monitoring and assessment for the protection of academic freedom and um, institutional autonomy within the Council of um, Europe um, space. Um, and um, you um, referred to a number of developments at, at the European um, EU level, um, including and perhaps most notably the um, um, ruling by the um, Court of Justice of the EU uh, from October um, uh, that found that um, the um, provisions of um, um, the, the relevant provisions of the EU Charter, but also WTO law, um, were breached by by Lex the EU. So th there seems to be um, sort of a positive um, environment for academic freedom. But if you kind of dig down a bit deeper and question it, um, there are, there are a number of issues. So um, the ruling um, with respect to CEU obviously came too late in terms of the defence of academic freedom within Hungary. It does send out um, uh, an important moral and um, legal message um, uh, in terms of academic freedom in Europe. But as far as the institutional institution goes, CEU had to already uh, relocate. And thankfully, had the resources and determination and support to do that. But that's not always possible, and that can't be envisaged in in, in every such case. So the EU case, I think, really exposed the weaknesses and the um, uh, uh, delay when it comes to um, EU processes. Um, and um, apart from showing upon as the sort of final bastion for, for uh, protecting um, academic freedom in Europe. Um, I think it also shows the weakness of the other institutions, um, in particular the Commission um, and the Council, um, who ought to have acted sooner and um, more forcefully um, with respect to um, concerning Hungary. Um, but um, there is now um, the German presidency's prioritization of um, the rule of law um, and the proposal that it should be reflected in a new um, mechanism setting out um, strong EU principles um, and um, rule of law values, including concerning academic freedom as conditions for EU funding. But at the moment, as far as I understand, those negotiations have been thwarted um, or at least uh, presented with major hurdles as a result of um, the positions of Hungary and Poland and backed by Slovenia. Um, um, but nonetheless, those negoci negotiations are continuing. So that's that's a space to watch the idea of having a, a rule of law um, conditionality mechanism for, for EU funds, which could potentially have, have greater bite. Thanks. Thank you, Sejal. Martina, would you like to elaborate further from your perspective? Yes, definitely. the the recent the recent recent proceedings um, on on the strengthening of legal frameworks of academic freedom are truly um, an achievement and and a, and a big step in the right direction, particularly from the top levels. This is coming a lot from the top levels, and it's great to see that. I can speak more from the point of view from the students' perspective, from the from the grassroots level. And as, as Sejal correctly mentioned, this came a little, many of them came a little too late. And as we see in, in Belarus, um, where students are, are now, a lot of the support um, within the movement, a lot of the leaders of the movement are either in exile or arrested. Many people are giving up, many people are losing hope. And it's, it would be important that we, push towards um, seeing more more effect on the ground um, of these legal proceedings and how they can really ha really have an impact on the people that are at the front line um, standing for standing and sacrificing um, their 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 safety for for, the, for their rights and for their country's freedom so in in that regard I think it's 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 quite a good I don't want to. I don't want to take it for granted, and it is something that is very important to see that even the EU is, is putting in these conditions for the rule of law tied within the the multi-level financial framework. That's really important as well. But let's not forget then the bottom-up approach of really showing that this has an impact to the people on the on the ground. Then, 
Thank you so much, Martina. I see that we have a number of questions coming in already from participants, and I invite you to continue submitting questions, but I'm going to begin fielding some of these. Um, so, Sejal, I think these are uh, follow-up questions to you in relation to the recent European Court of Justice um, decision around Lex CEU. Um, so there's one question asking about what you think the consequences will be from the recent uh, ECJ decision and perhaps um, a, connect, a question that, that is linked to that is pressure from EU officials can stop or can pressure from EU officials stop or reverse the developments in countries like Hungary? Um, okay, um, as far as reversing goes, um, as CEU has said that it's not, it's not going to um, return its its uh, its programs to um, uh, Budapest. So, excuse me. Very sorry about that. Um, I thought I switched it off. Um, um, so um, as far as reversing goes, um, uh, I, I don't think that's going to be possible. CEU is firmly located in, in, in Vienna now. Um, uh, the, the, the Court of um, Justice ruling is binding, but there were also proceedings at the domestic level concerning the constitutionality of, the, um, of Lex CEU, which still are to be determined. And, there's, and they're going to be determined by what is essentially a, a packed judiciary um, tasked with, um, uh, you know, uh, somehow um, uh, interpreting um, Lex CEU um, in accordance with, with EU law. But there's going to be a real tension, tension there um, between the, the values of the EU when it comes to academic freedom and the sense of sort of the defense of the constitutional identity of Hungary by the judiciary. So I, I don't think um, it would be an easy task even, e even if that door was open. I mean, the Hungarian government has said that there was nothing to stop um, CEU from carrying on its um, operations in, in Hungary. Um, but, but clearly that, that wouldn't have been um, possible, certainly with regard to its US accredited programs. Um, I think the, the, the challenge with the decision of the Court of Justice, is, apart from the fact that it came too late, is that it has a sort of um, the, the effect of um, leaving um, uh, an academic community in Hungary um, and also the, the CEU academic community rather disappointed and sort of deflated um, at um, the response of EU institutions. You know, there's a sense of, I think Martina mentioned it, a loss of hope, apart from the loss of trust in the institutions as being the backup, as, as being, um, uh, you know, the, the, the fallback in case the, the protection of fundamental values aren't, um, it isn't met by, by state institutions, especially for a country like Hungary. So I don't think there is a, there is a reversal. I mean, um, Budapest will remain a home for, for CEU. There is the new Institute for Democracy there. So there will be some operations, but the operations have by and large moved to Vienna. My, my concern is that if it wasn't for the fact that CEU managed to rally this incredible sort of unprecedented global campaign with um, you know Nobel um, laureates and former UN Secretary Generals and a multitude of universities as well as you know civil society actors um, you know the, the the moral force of CEU's claim was was so much in the public eye so we know about that story but if that was another institution um, I'm not sure whether it could have had the same sort of moral success if not legal one um, that CEU had. So um, the concern is, ab is about um, re-engaging these institutions so um, they do take a stance. And I think there is a connection with um, the case of Professor Zadursky in Poland. I mean, um, academics, um, uh, you know, across the world have, have supported Zadursky's case, um, but there's been very little um, um, from, from politicians elsewhere um, beyond um, Poland, uh, but also within Poland, speaking out against the use of slap lawsuits uh, against individual academics. 
Thank you, Sejal. Maybe before we go further, could you explain for participants, um, because we do see a lot of media reports right now around um, SLAP lawsuits, and could you just spell that out for us a little bit further and its impact on academic freedom? And then, um, Martina, I'll turn to you. I know there, there are a number of questions here relating to Esme's work in particular, so I want to get to those also. Um, but Sejal, maybe just a few explanatory words yeah. would be helpful there. So um, SLAP lawsuits are um, strategic lawsuits against public participation, which have long been used against NGOs, um, but especially um, also media organizations um, and journalists, um, not necessarily um, uh, launched to win the case uh, or to win the lawsuits, um, but, but as a tactic to, to silence, to intimidate. Um, and often they take the form of um, civil and, and, and criminal defamation lawsuits um, undertaken by um, state authorities or others closely linked to the state, like the um, public broadcaster in, in the case of Poland. Um, so, um, you know, Poland is a particular concern. Um, there are a number of uh, uh, slap lawsuits against a particular newspaper, um, Gazeta um, Wyborcza, um, uh, since 2015. Um, uh, brought by the by by the ruling Law and Justice Party, I think they number about uh, fifty five, in fact, and and there is a, a coalition of civil society organisations trying to fight them. But but essentially, it, it's it's about chilling chilling expression and the space for expression um, originally used against or, or um, used first against the media, but now it seems increasingly against academics and those who speak out, including on social media, as Professor Zadorsky did. Thank you, Sejal. So in the interest of time, we're going to switch uh, gears a little bit here and ask some practical questions to you, uh, Martina, some of which are, are coming in uh, via Vimeo. So how can the European Students' Union help support or connect protesting university students who would like to connect with each other or to network? Um, so that's, that one is for you, Martina. Thank you for the question. Um, through our membership, so basically ESU is an umbrella organization. It uh, represents 45 national unions of students from, from 40 countries. And through our membership, we um, reach out to, to students within, within those countries, but we are also um, open to any other non-member countries that reach out to us for support. Um, in addressing in addressing issues within their countries, for example, we were once reached out by some international students who knew about us who um, were studying in Turkey and heard, had heard of a student um, who was uh, detained detained in Turkey. And then we coordinated solidarity actions. Uh, we tried establishing contact with some local organisations there, um, with with human rights organisations. So it the way that we coordinate our solidarity actions is very very diverse depending on depending on the situation um we try as much as possible to uh, expose more of esu and and who it is and what is what it doing what it's doing and how it can connect people together uh, through our members and if there's anyone that's willing to 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 get to um come forward and, and approach us, please do so um, after, after this conference. Because then what we do is that we try to connect students not only together, but also with um, partner organizations like the Scholars at Risk and Am Amnesty International, so that we, because we know that their expertise in, in the field is, is much longer and, and, and much better than, than ours in this regard. So our, our um, capacity there is to connect mainly. Mm -hmm. Um, and Martina, what are some of those very concrete needs that are being reported directly to um, either your partner unions or directly to the European Students Union from students in Belarus right now? What are some of the concrete needs? I think that Martina's... Um, frozen at the moment. So maybe Sejal, we will turn back to you for um, another of the remaining questions here. Um, in your your own excellent article uh, in EGIL Talk, 
uh, almost a year ago, you um, <laughs> specifically recommended that the special rapporteur on freedom of opinion and expression at, that he develop a thematic report to the Human Rights Council um, or the General Assembly on academic freedom. And so, as you know, this report has now been issued. Um, so what advice would you have for organizations like Scholars at Risk Europe um, or our partners that are involved in academic freedom advocacy as to how best to use that report, either in the specific um, situation of Belarus or um, with other, other, uh, the other challenges that are facing, less severe challenges that are facing other countries across Europe? How can such reports really be used in a practical way by academic freedom advocates? Um. So that, yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, first of all, I'd just like to say that um, you know, scholars at lit risk is a leading player in this space of academic freedom. It occupies a unique space, and it should continue doing what it's doing, um, including through um, these uh, reports, um, which are really empowering for um, academics on the ground and activists wanting to support um, the cause of um, freedom and academic freedom. Um, so in terms of using um, the Special Rapporteur's report, I think it's, it's a fantastic um, contemporary um, synthesis of the, the global challenges um, uh, facing um, scholars and students um, and institutions across the world and it has a number of recommendations which I think um, can be used as a basis um, and um, as, a, as, a, as a footing for, for advocacy um, um, in different contexts including in the European context before multilateral institutions of the EU, um, at the Council of Europe level um, uh, you know, before states, but also within those academic institutions themselves, I think it, I think it should be a, um, a reference point. Um, but I think an institution like Scholars at Risk and um, other human rights organizations with a particular focus on, on free expression and academic um, freedom, or, or those that would like to get into this space, should use the report to um, support claims um, of academic freedom or for academic freedom uh, before other human rights bodies, um, including at the level of universal periodic review. Um, so using the report to lobby states to raise questions of academic freedom as such, um, you know, in that universal periodic review process. Um, also lobbying for a general comment um, by the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights on Academic Freedom, which may seem like a very particular and sort of legalistic um, objective, but actually having a general comment can, can really um, energize and galvanize um, the community, but also is, you know, the, the most um, sort of the, the hardest kind of soft law, if you like it, in legal language, or, or the sort of strongest basis you know of interpret of interpretation when it comes to legal provisions um, binding treaty provisions concerning or relating to academic freedom um, um, that are, that exist in in, in, in the, the covenants of economic social and cultural rights um, so um, I think there are a number of ways that um, scholars at risk can use the the text but uh, but I think partly because the um, report was announced and presented by um, the successor of the the special rapporteur who who um, who wrote it, David Kay wrote it, and Irene Khan presented it. Perhaps it hasn't had so far in the in the short period that has passed since the General Assembly enough attention. But but, but I think going forward, um, there can definitely be a spotlight on this um, by scholars at risk and um, uh, partners um, of the uh, of the network. Thank you, Sage Alan. This is definitely something that uh, Scholars at Risk Europe, together with the new uh, European Advocacy Committee, of which Martina is a part, will be taking forward. And, and we'd love to have your advice as we go along on that road. Um, we are fast running out of time. Um, in about three minutes, we're going to have a call to action. Maybe to set that up, Martina, if uh, you were interrupted in your discussion of the immediate needs that you are hearing reported from students in Belarus. Um, and since our call to action is on that very topic, could you maybe in one minute um, just summarize some of the reports that you are getting? Yes, definitely. And I apologize for my disconnection. Um, so what what we've also been um, trying to do is continue to raise awareness on the situation, not let um, the situation in Belarus be forgotten. 
and we're doing a lot of that through through social media. Uh, but also, uh, there are many, many, many fundraising um, links towards uh, those students and academics that have been detained to support their 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 legal actions. And uh, we're now focusing as well on how we can support uh, exiled students and continue to uh, help them to share their stories and, and continue to connect. There's also, that, that is sort of on the short term, while on the long term, we're also trying to continue enhancing um, capacity building on, on academic freedom and to continue uh, supporting the implementation of a students at risk scheme that was first created in Norway. Um, and many of our unions are also interested in learning how they can replicate that because they have already been lobbying with their ministers uh, to offer scholarship schemes for exiled students uh, from Belarus. So uh, it, it goes within the, the students at risk scheme for them to further develop. Excellent. Thank you so much, Martina. And let me echo and repeat both of your messages to, uh, in particular, to today's uh, ministers meeting at the European Higher Education Area event that uh, academic freedom has to be a precondition for quality in higher education. They cannot be separated and the Bologna process needs to be more than, than words. Um, so I'm afraid that is all the time we have for this session. Thank you to the panelists for sharing your time and expertise. We are so grateful. Thank you to everyone in the audience, especially those who shared or liked questions and helped enrich our discussion. And our apologies that we couldn't get to all of the questions. We are now going to have a brief call to action related to our panel discussion. Hello, my name is Denise Roach and I'm the Advocacy Manager with the European Office of Scholars at Risk. At Scholars at Risk, we express our deep concern and solidarity with students, scholars and other citizens of Belarus that continue to suffer targeted and broad-based attacks in the aftermath of the recent presidential elections as they demonstrate their fundamental right to peaceful protest. We urge Belarusian authorities to live up to their international human rights obligations and their commitments as members of the European Higher Education Area's Bologna process to protect and promote the fundamental values of the European higher education area, including academic freedom, integrity and institutional autonomy. SAR supports and echoes the words of the European Universities Association and the European Students' Union that these commitments cannot be just empty words, they must be followed by action. Therefore, today, we ask you all to please share SAR's statement and call to action on Belarus on all possible platforms using the hashtag Belarus Solidarity. Make sure to tag SAR as well as your higher education leaders and national and regional policy makers, including, for example, your university, your minister for education, your minister for foreign affairs, and your local member of the European Parliament. You can find this statement on our website at scholarsatrisk.org forward slash action. An attack on one scholar is an attack on all. You can help. Your action condemning attacks on scholars and students in Belarus will prevent the normalization of attacks and help demand their release. Your actions matter. Every post and retweet will help bring increased attention to their situation. You can help us get the message out there. Please share the statement as widely as possible. Our colleagues in Belarus are counting on us. Thank you. Thank you, Denise, for this important call to action in support of students and scholars in Belarus. And thank you again to everyone in the audience. As we noted earlier, this session is part of Scholars at Risk's virtual conference, Free to Think 2020. I invite you to visit the conference page for the schedule and links to other sessions. A recording of this session will be available soon and posted on the Scholars at Risk website. We would welcome your help in sharing the link when it's available with those you think might be interested. Thank you.